is better in the light. There's no reason you should be defeated. God will fight your battles with his might. So walk away from darkness, leave behind defeat. In Jesus there is happiness complete. Our God specializes in good things, things that you and I the body and spirit. All you have to do is just believe. Good things, good things. All you have to do is just believe. Praise the Lord, God's children. I'm ringing in to Pastor Karen right now to see if she, we can get her online. Um, what a glorious day. That God has given us to worship Him in and to, uh, let's see, I'll just try again in a minute, uh, to worship Him in and to uh, share His Word. You know, we want to learn to walk in His Word and in His will. Once again, I'm going to try to reach Pastor Karen. <laughs> uh, we were having a little connection problem this morning, but we're going to get together right away. <clears throat> She'll answer in just a second or two. Meanwhile, uh, there she is. Good morning. There she's trying to get, that's all right, don't worry about it. I'm just going to go ahead a little bit. I was talking to the folks. Uh, we want to learn how to walk in God's word and his will. Now, I'll let you know who I am. I'm Dr. Stephanie, your host, along with my co-host, Pastor Karen Weitzman, and we're, we're here today together to welcome you to Living the Word. Did you come expecting to receive today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from God. So get that expecta expectation level elevated because when you come expecting to receive, you're going to gain wisdom, insight, and understanding and make a better revelatory connection with your heart and your mind. So open your hearts now and prepare to receive. You know, Pastor Karen and I will be bringing you understanding of the practi and practical application of God's Word to your life. Uh, all those things that you didn't understand that you can't apply because you say, well, 2,000 years ago they were a different culture, that was then and this is now, and this doesn't apply anymore. Well, that's where you're wrong. It does apply, and we're going to teach you how to walk in God's Word and apply those 2,000-year-old statutes and ordinances to your life today. And we're going to discuss the commandments that Jesus gave us in our blood covenant, His statutes, His ordinances, and how to operate in them in our daily life. We will not only be imparting God's wisdom, we'll also be giving you insights into our God and His character to help you grow in Christ. Stay with us and learn how to, walk, how to apply and walk successfully in living the Word. Good morning, Pastor Karen. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. <laughs> Here we go, shake, rattle, roll. <laughs> Hello, hello. There, there, I can hear something. Can you? Yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, good morning, Pastor Good morning. Stephanie. I know that uh, I had to go ahead and start, which was okay, but everything worked out well, and here we are together at long last. I have missed you for the past week or two. It seems like we talked more frequently, and now we have, have been running, doing our thing, and and uh, haven't had a chance. And usually we get we get together, folks, and talk a little bit before the program. <laughs> we missed each other today, so it's kind of like ah. <laughs> it's it's raining here. Oh no! Oh well, but, I probably need it. <laughs> yeah, it, it uh, we always have good rain here, so that's that's yeah, great. That is good. Well, right now, folks, take a second to assemble a small piece of bread or cracker and. Um, some, a swallow of some sort of beverage or juice, it could even be water, and set it aside. Later on, we're going to pray over it, sanctifying it as the body and the blood of Christ. Also, we have a chat room, and that chat room you can enter during the program to ask questions, make comments, and so on. And uh, we'll address them later on in the program if we have any. If you don't hear us address them, it's because we didn't get any. <laughs> okay, but let's begin right now by inviting the Holy Spirit to join us. Pastor Karen, would you open us in prayer? Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for living the word that um, it's a chance for people to come, for us to come together, speak the word of God, um, let, his praises, let his praises go forth out of our mouth, and to understand how to apply the word in our everyday lives. Lord, we give you all praise, glory, and honor. Uh, we thank you that um, the word that flows out of us today might be something that... Uh, 
some statement or some word that someone was waiting to hear and that they can p apply uh, to their office life, to their home life, um, where, wherever it's most needed, Lord Jesus. Father, um, we uh, thank you that we have that Pastor Stephanie and I and have this time together and um, let it be uh, glorious for all and let you get all the glory from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Now, folks, today we're going to continue our study of grace, but we're taking a little rabbit trail that the Lord has put me on. And as I promised you last week, we're going to be discussing the believer's power. Um, it's part and parcel of what grace has been uh, ha has given to us as a gift, and it's part of who you are in Christ. And if you don't understand who you are in Christ, uh, it's vitally important that you do. So this is going to help you. I can promise you that. You have to know that you do have power and that you ha who gave it to you and what it does so that you can go forward with it. And I'm going to take my time with it. And, uh, and Pastor Karen and I have uh, studied this in depth. We had uh, the same kind of a subject matter in our e-crusade this year, this last year, uh, that we just did. And um, so it's not something that you probably haven't heard if you've been with us for a while, but if you're, not, if you're new to us and we're new to you, then you maybe haven't heard it before. And it's going to maybe enlighten you and give you some insights uh, that are vital to your growth in Christ. Um, you know... Um, God, this series that uh, this is taken from is, a is on power, the authority of the believer, God's power, Jesus's power, the power of the Holy Spirit, and your power, the power of the believer. And you'll be given, and I pray that you obtain from this a complete understanding of who you are in Christ insofar as how it applies to the power of God within you. <clears throat> now to accomplish all that he's purposed for you here on this earth, you need that power. And, uh, you will also gain what your purpose is. I mean, we're, we, this is kind of a crash course, this little uh, thing we're doing today, but it may develop into something. We just go with the Holy Spirit and let him take us where we need to go. All right. Uh, once you've gained this knowledge, then the application of those principles is key to your seeing the results you're supposed to operate in. We begin with the believer's power, the authority that was given to us by God, and we actually understand uh, about it today certain things. We understand uh, that we have the authority to bind and loose. We understand that we have the authority to take uh, authority over things. We just don't know how to do it. So we're going to turn again to consider in detail first the powers and the things that have been made subject to our Lord in His elevation and appointment to the Father's right hand. Now, as we meditate on the completeness of his authority, let's remember that he is there as the representative of redeemed humanity. Hebrews 2, 5 through 9 is our text. And let's ask the Lord this. May the eyes of our understanding be enlightened by the Holy Spirit, so that we may believe without any doubt or skepticism that the wisdom and the will of the Father have made us sharers in this same authority, and that he absolutely, unequivocally, intends that we should exercise it day by day in growing comprehension and application in our lives. The Word of God says this, For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak, in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place, saying, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all the subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Okay. Let's go back through this because there's a couple of places we have to fix. <laughs> um, in the uh, text, the original text, it says a little lower. He has made him a little lower than the Elohim. And the Elohim is God, not angels. And that is a mistranslation. The, actually, the committee that got together that translated the Bible in, in the first place couldn't accept the fact that mankind was put in that high of a position in Christ. So they put them as the angels. And that's how that happened. And that happened again when it says it again in the, in the same uh, context. Uh, do you have anything you want to say about that, Pastor Karen? Um, just Elohim um, is 
means usually a plural, uh, looking at God in a plural sense, looking at him as the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. as one God. Um, that's the only thing I, you know, that's the only thing I know about Elohim is it's uh, referring to the, the Godhead, the full Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, and in that context, that same context, we fall as well because when we are in Christ Jesus, we are part of that Godhead, even though we're a little lower. We're made a little lower than that Godhead. Okay. But it isn't. But then the angels come under us. They're subject to us. They're there to serve us. Just, I just want the people to get an understanding of the hierarchy. So I'm glad you brought that sure. up so that we can explain it. Um, we see first that the risen Christ has been made to sit. The act of sitting indicates that for the time being, certain aspects of his work are not in effect. And later, the Lord will again rise up to the prey, the enemy. Uh, however, now... With all authority given to him, he is awaiting the Father's time, meanwhile exercising the powers placed in his hands for the working out of the redemption which was purchased for mankind by him on the Calvary. On Calvary. So in other words, what, what I'm saying to you is that right now, this is that the Lord, the Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has all the power given to him over this earth, everything on the earth, in the earth, under the earth, and everything. However... He can't exercise all of it because he has to wait on the Father's time when he will come a second time. When First, when he's, he raptures the church and brings us up out of here, and God will give him that time frame, and then he will rise up again at the second coming to the prey, to the enemy, in other words. And then mm -hmm. he will do, take uh, full, of, full authority over everything that he... He'll exercise that authority. He's got the authority. He'll just exercise it at that time. Um... Now, his session is far above all principality and power and might and dominion. So great princes and authorities of whom we've previously spoken in other lessons and that we talk about all the time about those in heavenly places, those darkened uh, devils, are, they're all subject to him. So are the lesser ones. He is far above all might. Dunameos, <coughs> a word used usually in the New Testament of spiritual power. Now, this refers to that working of satanic energy, demonic forces in the atmosphere, which is becoming increasingly manifested and directed against the bodies and minds of the born-again believers, the children of God. Remember, if you are a child of God, you are a born-again believer. If you're not born again, you are still a child of darkness. So, get born again and become a child of God. The inroads uh, that are being made into Christian communities are actually appalling. What, what I'm talking about through the uh, demonic forces. And the sad fact is that few in the church actually are awake to the fact that fresh powers from the enemy's unseen world are actually flooding in on us. And the cause of this is not hard to trace, folks. It's the parts of the heathen world where the word of God energized by the spirit of God has penetrated that the powers of the air have actually fallen back. Demon possession is less prevalent due to aggressive evangelism that's been taking place, and therefore its manifestations have become less frequent. But in our own so-called Christian lands, the authority of the word is now being called into question by the great leaders of the churches. And there are fewer and fewer theological institutions, seminaries, and schools of ministry where it's recognized as the very word of God. So the spirit of God is dishonored. First, by the very denial of the word, which he's inspired, and second, by the disregard paid to his person and authority. Therefore, there's a reversal to heathen conditions spiritually that's taking place, and I'm sure that you can see it. We've been discredited. We are now being oppressed. But take heart, if you're a born-again believer, remember that Jesus said to us that <clears throat> even uh, as he is despised, even so we would be despised because of him. So, as the great agents for the overthrow of demonic powers, the Word of God and the Spirit of God are discredited. And these demonically driven powers and principalities are pressing in again upon our country and our people. Now, once, uh, one evidence of this fact is the tremendous advance that spiritualism is making among the people. Uh, jump in here anytime you want to say anything. <laughs> I don't mean to leave it leave you out cuz I know well, that Well, I mean there's we see these uh, things. there's a lot of activity in the cult, there's a lot of mm -hmm. activity in spirit spiritism, um um you know, new age. There's there's, you know, a lot of activity going on in in those areas that are causing pro uh increase in in uh, demonic activity. You know, uh, you're so right. Last night, uh, of all things, which is very ironic, but last night I, I had fallen asleep. I'm 
and uh, I woke up and I had the television on. It was still going. And there came on a commercial. I just barely had awakened. And this commercial came on for the psychic hotline. They're actually starting that up all over again. I thought that thing had gone off by the wayside a long time ago, many, many years ago. Now here it comes again. The psychic thing, which is, as we know, is part of the occult. Um, and the enemy is trying to really ingrain himself. He's like tentacles on an octopus, just sneaking in and trying to get a, a suction hold on anything and everybody. And I, I hate to say this, well, but... Yeah, go mm -hmm. ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was uh, just going to say, he's the great deceiver, mm -hmm. and, you know, he also heals. That's right. He also heals. And people are looking for a spiritual life, and... Um, they don't realize that just, you know, you can be off just a little bit away from the Word of God and um, you can come under demonic attack. Wait a minute. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Who who also heals? The devil? Yes. Yes, he also heals because I was involved with alternative medicine and energy kind of medicine and got, we know that Jesus heals. And... Um, the enemy heals also, but usually it's not something that will last. When God heals, it's for it's something that will last and be forever. But yes, I then I believe then I it, believe the enemy heals also. Yes. Well, that is a um, a deception then. Yeah, it's it a is deception. a deception. Okay, mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. just want to clarify that because um, it is a deception. If it anything that doesn't last, the thing of it is, is we walk around in bodies that are already healed. We just don't know it. Mm -hmm. And once we get a hold of it and, and learn how to operate in it, we walk in divine health because it's a gift from, of grace when we're born again. It's, re it's restoration. We've been restored back to that divine uh, being, you know, that ability. and that, uh, Well, that's not the word I want. Anyway, that condition, that divine condition. Uh, but if we don't know it, then we still hang on to our worldly thoughts and our thought processes, which are demonic. Uh, demonically driven, I should say, and we are deceived into thinking that, and, and you know what, I, I don't want to put down alternative medicine because alternative medicine leads the way oftentimes to Christ um, and to divine Yeah, I, I didn't mean to put it down uh -huh. either. I mean, I was involved uh, with alternative medicine yeah. for a, for but a long time. But there are some, there are some things that are about it that are definitely from the, from the demonic that we need to recognize so we can rightly divide. But but that not all, um, because well, they think, use holistic, uh, holistic stuff. They use the leaves of the trees to, to heal the nations as well. Yeah, but some sure. of that stuff is a little bit far out, but it's okay. <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I think it's just maybe an inroad. If we look at, mm -hmm. um, it may not be the medicine itself that, uh, and e no medicine is bad. I mean, Western medicine uses plants for drugs. Uh, alternative ma medicine uses nutrition. You uses, mm -hmm. uh, but I think it um, it can be an inroad for the or an open gate for the enemy to come in. S some some med some energy medicine. Yeah, I agree with you. And most of it is uh, uh, rooted and grounded in lack of knowledge. Right. It, it's uh, a worldly knowledge rather than the spiritual side of it. And the spiritual side of it has to come from God. It can't come from the natural or the supernatural, uh, from the demonic. And that's where we have to learn how to discern and rightly divide. Um, <clears throat> because a person can take, uh, a person could take what we do or what, how we believe and what we, we believe in, what, in operating in divine health, laying on of hands, you know, with it, where no medicine at all is involved, no medications. And yet they could say, well, that's poo-poo that too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where, whereas... All medicine, and I do believe this, and it's, uh, I seldom tell you what I do believe, but I do believe that all medicine is good, and I believe in doctors. I believe they are a gift from God to keep us from um, a cell, the, the, the uh, sickness and disease that we have allowed to be self-inflicted through lack of knowledge to our own bodies. We've opened ourselves up to the enemy to let him come in and do his tap dance. And whatever the end result is, when we come to grips with it some of some of our dear sweet brothers and sisters have gone on to to the lord at an early time they and that's where you say they early they sleep you know because of lack of knowledge when in fact if they had known what we know today mm -hmm. in uh, who are already actively operating in christ and walking in divine health 
they would know what that they have that power to withstand the enemy and that's what it is because the enemy takes their attention focuses it on the disease they come into agreement agreement with it and they take it and now mm -hmm. it's theirs and then they don't know how to untake it <laughs> you know because they haven't been taught so well maybe it's our walk with the lord our walk in the word maybe it's our authority that we have in the lord jesus christ where none of this might i mean i'm not you may know more about this than I, than I do, but where none, we can go for any kind of therapy. We can go anywhere, and nothing nothing would by any means affect us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you're right. That's right. Knowing our, you know, who we are, and knowing who we are in Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you get developed in who you are in Christ, and it's a slow process because it's a revelatory process. If you don't have revelation of it, it's like a rhema word. If it's not a rhema to you and it's not active, where you can put put it into practice in your life, it's not going to manifest mm -hmm. because we lack the knowledge of, and it's not just intellect. It's the head heart connection that puts it into proper perspective and it becomes a revelation to us that we go, oh, that's what that is. And then we apply it and it works and we go, oh, yay. And then we go up another level of glory. <laughs> you know, and that's the, the process. And God did that for a reason with us because we, our minds were blinded when we came into this world and they still are to a degree once we are born again. Then mm -hmm. we're on our journey in Christ to where we ought to be so that we can become the body of Christ fully operational, which is what we're going to be talking about here. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, God, Jesus is a healer and he, he alone wants to heal us. Not that he can't heal us through doctors. He can't heal us through acupuncturists. He can heal us through probably all those people. But I think we need to just know that the Lord wants, wants to heal us so, you know, solely by the word of God and mm -hmm. um, so solely in his power. Right. Yeah, I agree. You know, I recently met, uh, getting to the back to the spiritualism thing, I recently met a person who was really delightful to speak with. And in our during our discourse, I was told by that person that they are they were Christian. And uh, well, I was delighted. I thought that was great. And and uh, we were both talking about I wasn't talking about weddings. Actually, that person brought it up to me and said, that, oh, good, we're both Christians. We can officiate at weddings. And I said, well, do you have a church that you go, you know, just in, you know, not querying because I was trying to pinpoint anything, just conversation. I said, do you have a church? And I was told that um, they that this individual was a spiritualist and didn't believe in organized religion. And, you know, I thought to myself, I didn't re respond. I just uh, let it go. But I thought to myself, what a sta sad state of affairs. This is more prevalent each and every day and yet still received like a shocking jolt when a born-again believer encounters it. I, I mean, it was like somebody stuck my finger in a light socket and gave me a shock because I don't expect people who are operating in spiritualism to consider themselves Christians. And here they are officiating at weddings and... Uh, and uh, uh, what is the one I want to say? Um, and Speak, I don't, are they I don't speaking the word? A, and... No, they're not speaking the word. They are oh. using, uh, and this is where I'm having trouble because I want to make sure that I don't misspeak. It's, it's that they misuse, they believe in God. They believe in God, but they don't believe that Jesus has anything to do with anything. You know, and so consequently, they're just believers in God and they operate under this cloud of whatever in their mind there's it's kind of a floaty uh, e e e ephemera you know <laughs> I don't know how to put, how to put it mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, that doesn't have any basis it has no roots it has no grounds and and um, and in the conversation that I had with this particular individual on other things other than weddings I dropped that like a hot rock, and I went forward with uh, just other things, and then um, not to try to ca catch her or anything in, in a, a way, but we were just talking about stuff, worldly stuff. And, mm -hmm. and what I heard from her was giving God glory for the evil that's in the world, giving God glory for uh, sickness and disease to teach people lessons, you know, all the things that I know to be a lie from the pit of hell. God is getting all the glory for that from these people because they only think there's a God. They And I'm not even saying they believe it. They just think there's a God. They, she has no idea where she's going if she died today. 
I asked her. She said, no, I don't know. I may, I hope I go to heaven, you know. And so here we have it. These people are it's kind of mocking. It's kind of a mockery is, I guess, the word I want. It, they're standing in, officiating at weddings, under the guise and the umbrella of God, and uh, you putting words in, in God's mouth, <laughs> you know. It's it's just a travesty. It truly is a travesty. And mm -hmm. and when the push comes to shove, they believe in ghosts, you know. And yeah, it's it's and, the wrong, it's the wrong God. It's a it's yeah. a different God. Yeah, it is. It's it's some a different God. Pagan. Figure. I guess I can give a little bit of a testimony here in that uh, mm -hmm. I was involved in alternative medicine and um, had done some things, researched in that area, always looking for. Uh, always looking for a cure, always looking for uh, the cure for my patients and so forth. So I thought, well, this is an area that might hold some remedies. So um, I, you know, I, I had gone to a spiritualist church before. Uh, I, not that I became a member or anything, but I researched in the that area quite a bit and found and uh, even went to even went to uh, psychics. And, um, you know, um, so, um, my testimony was that, um, when I, uh, when I found out that it was wrong, uh, of course I, I repented and so forth, but, um, I also was under the tutelage of doctor, um, of a doctor who had written books on spirituality, um, uh, who had, uh, you know, research, uh, he was a medical doctor, and who had re researched in that area also, and he had come to the, he had had to repent and confess also, I was under his tutelage, and, and he said all, anything uh, away from the the word of God and the teaching of the Lord, uh, the word of God is the wrong, it, the wrong God, we're worshiping the wrong God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he mm -hmm. had done, he had done so much research in that area also, so, um, well, you know, you know, that reminds me and you're right. And, and I agree with you on that because, um, that there was, um, I don't know, Carl Baugh, I could, I had to think of his name. Carl mm -hmm. Baugh is the, a fellow who was a mathematician and mm -hmm. he did not believe he was, uh, an atheist. He did not believe in God. He did not believe in Jesus Christ. And he was a scientist who went out through his mathematic prowess was going to prove that there wasn't any God. Mm -hmm. And he began doing his calculations, and <laughs> what ended up happening was he found that there was God, that there was Jesus Christ, and he immediately accepted Christ as his Savior. And now he, he operates and has for many years um, the um, Creation Museum. Yeah, I think it's in Missouri. I can't remember if in Missouri. But... Um, because I, uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly where it's located. I should because I use it all the time in my <laughs> speak. But uh, anyway, it's fabulous. And he has done uh, just a marvelous work with his creation museum to show you that there is a God. And, and from creation, it's really elaborate. It's very nice and, w and well put together. I actually, uh, Kenneth Copeland uh, Ministry had him on their daily broadcast one one week but it wasn't just for a week it was a whole series of maybe three weeks and they had some other prevalent pastors on there too uh, at the same time and they were doing this kind of a conference it was great and they recorded it so I bought those uh, videotapes and uh -huh. had them and I used them in my classrooms to teach about it to, be, because it's it helps to break down the, the myth of uh, the creation uh, our creation, the creation of the world, and everything and in Genesis, where it comes in and it pretty much is concise. Genesis is like an outline. It, it kind of just jumps in there and mashes it all together in the, the creation days and stuff so that we don't see what happened before the foundation of the world, blah, 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 you know. And this, uh, Carl Baugh has studied this out now, and that has been his passion. That's his niche, you know, and he has done this marvelous teaching and you can get it online if you go to just google Carl Baugh B-A-U-G-H and when you do he has Creation Museum and you can go there on the website and you can buy the, the discs the videos now uh, one I had was in the VHS sticking in the big boxy kind you know um, mm -hmm. now, but you can get the the discs now and you can also download probably to your I don't know he's got all kinds of newfangled stuff that is state-of-the-art but it's amazing those things and he's got a lot of different teachings and stuff that are just fabulous and uh, like I say he's a born-again believer and he is 
uh, deeply steeped in the Word of God. And But it, it was amazing to me because well, my point of bringing that up is because he was one who didn't believe and had uh, all kinds of, you know, atheistic attitudes towards everything that was all God or anything and found through just through doing mathematical mathematical equations that God does exist. You know, that mm -hmm. there is God, there's no doubt about it, and he can say to you, this is the proof, there's no doubt, and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and there's no doubt, you know, so uh, there are... Born that reminds me of a rabbi over in Israel uh -huh. who, um, he died and he asked for a letter not to be opened up or something that he had written um, that he didn't want opened up until after he had passed away. I don't know his name or anything, but when he... Um, um, when they opened up his letter, he revealed that Jesus was the Messiah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's what... Amen. <laughs> well, another proof, the very doctrines of the church. Instead of teaching God's doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, many of the churches are becoming depleted. I mean, this is proof of the uh, insidious manner that we are, are now steeping ourselves in in this world. Uh, uh, many of the churches are becoming depleted of their vital spiritual force. You see, we see the evidence in the rampant, twisted word that's coming from the pulpits. And I want you to understand something: not all the pulpits that are not that are not teaching in depth. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Are wrong. It's that what they're teaching you is a surface level of teaching because they don't understand the depth. Mm -hmm. And it's not it's lack of knowledge of what that's what God calls lack of knowledge. It's lack of understanding the word of God in depth. And so they're teaching what they were taught. But because they don't know the depth of it, they, they can't back it up. They can't back it up from the scriptures. They can give you the scriptures of what they're saying to say, yeah, this is true because it's here. And here it is. And you can read it for yourself. But they don't know how to connect the deeper scriptures with the meanings that they have because they don't understand it, you know? And I, I know that sounds like, I, I don't mean that I'm talking down to people. That just happened to be me. If you're not a Bible scholar, then it's not going to matter to you. But most of us who are born-again believers that are in the fivefold ministry anymore, I'll say anymore, have uh, gone in-depth into Bible scholarly studies because... When you get through the surface teaching, it's like there's got to be more than this. This isn't mm -hmm. enough. It raises, I've gotten through this section, and now that raises other questions. So I have to have answers to those questions. It's like being a detective, and you just keep digging and searching and digging, and the more that you hunger and thirst in that area, the more God's going to reveal to you because the Word is alive, and you have no idea. Uh, some of us may have, some of us may have experienced it, but I'm just saying you have no idea on the general public, the general born again believer does not have any idea what power they have, who they are in Christ, why they have to be in Christ and what that involves when they get saved. It's because they want to know that they're going to heaven when they die and they get eternal life in, in heaven. They think, but we don't live in heaven. That's our heavenly home. That's where we were created and put here in our kingdom. We will have our ruling and reigning in our kingdom. But um, I want to add also one thing that um, it's so easy if we get out of the why it's so important to be in the word. And I know lately I've had trouble being in the word. And I think we all go through those stages. Mm -hmm. But um, I think why it's so important is that we can... Um, we uh, we can get a spirit of what we call a spirit of error, mm -hmm. and it's so easy. It's so easy for the enemy just to you know bring in <laughs> something that sounds right, and maybe sounds right and looks right and and feels right and and appeals to our senses and everything. But um, it, it could be a spirit of error, and that's why we have. That's one of the reasons that we have to stay close to the Word of God. That's right, because otherwise the demonic teachings that are coming from the pulpits that are twisted are the very ones that Paul warned his hearers to be aware of. You know, we're mm -hmm. supposed to be aware of those. We have to learn, first of all, how to read the Bible and so that when we read the Word, we don't take it out of context. It's easy to take it out of context. We shouldn't be reading the Bible looking for to prove that what we believe is the truth. Of course, we will be looking for that, but we should be going in there and looking at those scriptures and saying, okay... 
here's the here this sounds like this scripture may sound, sounds like what it, what I believe so now go back up three or four scriptures and look at what that's saying because usually what happens is when we say we're taking it out of context isn't that we're making it tw uh, fit what we want it to it's that it doesn't fit anything of what you're believing or what you're looking for if you read at least three or four maybe five uh, sentences before the scripture and then go down and finish it out with two or three or more on the bottom you're going to see what that scripture is talking about and you'll find that for the most part if you're if you're um, not able if it doesn't fit you'll you'll know it and then you'll say well oh I see that's not the right scripture so then you go on and you dig further I'm not saying that there isn't a scripture in there that will back up what you're saying but this is how we learn to read the Bible plus the fact we have to always think about this who is the the word of God uh, who who are they talking to whoever the speaker is in this incident who are they talking to is this a recorded event or is this um, instruction to the believer more most often than not what's happening is that people are taking recorded events out of the Bible and using them as backup for what they believe when in doctrine a, for yeah, doctrine for doctrine and and uh, actually, that isn't the case at all. Recorded events are there so that you can see God and his power and his moves, and that if he did it, then he could do it again. We're seeing the power of God in action and the, and the purpose of God in action and, and his plan in action. Uh, and, how, and we also see how we go from glory to glory, just like we're going from all the people in the Old Testament and how they were looking toward the cross, you know, because they didn't have the cross at that time. They didn't have the Holy Spirit at that time. They're looking toward the cross as they go from glory to glory up towards the cross. And now we, as born-again believers, look back to the cross, but we're also still going forward to into God. Because we are returned from, uh, we go from God to this earth, in, in veiled in, in uh, deception and darkness, we mm -hmm. look for Christ, the door. We accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We go through that door. Now we are a new creation in Christ Jesus, able to stand again before the Father and be in Him. Where before we came from Him, and we come back to Him full circle. And not everybody will, because they get down mm -hmm. here and they like what's going on in this world, you know. But Well, one of the things, too, about you were talking about the cross and looking to the cross. Mm -hmm. uh, remember in Numbers when... Um, the uh, Israel, the um, Hebrews were being bitten and they were dying. I, I think it was the by snakes. serpents or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. And um, God commanded Moses to get a, a, a fiery serpent and put it on top of the pole. And when the uh, Hebrews would look at it, um, they would be healed. Well, that's that shows that the cross itself, looking towards the cross, looking towards Jesus, in itself, when we come to the cross. In itself, looking at it will uh, has will we has will power. we will be healed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, yeah, they were. They, think about this. There was like uh, two and a half to three million people in that group, and so when God commanded that, uh, told Moses to make that uh, get a stick and put that snake on the top. Mm -hmm. The snake was actually done in bronze, so that it would glint it in the sun. But they put it on a hill where. All these people could see it. So think how huge this thing had to be. You know, they didn't have binoculars then. So, you know, it had to be something where they could all see it. And three million people in one group seeing it had to have been up on a mountain and in hugeness enough to be able to tell what it was. You know? mm -hmm. And those mm -hmm. that did not look at the snake on the cross, or, you know, the, the, the pole, died. Died. And died. The snakes were always there. They were always there. They were there to begin with. You know, that's the amazing part. And uh, it was just that when God's people came, they were bitten. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, spiritual, uh, supernatural spiritual connotations in there that's a huge rabbit trail that's going to take me someplace I don't want to go right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you're right. That's a great, great analogy, too. Uh, but remember, you become what you hear and see. We become what we hear and see because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right. And what we let come through our eye gates, if we're reading the Bible, we are lifted up by that and we are brought along the way we should be into our heart connection. So you are what are you watching? Are you watching scary shows on TV? 
things that instill fear because fear is the, the avenue, the, the vehicle that the enemy uses to get a hold of your attention. <laughs> you become what you hear and you see. So take a look at our society. Now just look at it. What have they become? And I say they because I'm a born again believer, so I'm set apart. I'm looking down on something. Um, I'm not down my nose at something. I'm just looking at something from a distance because I believe that I'm set apart because I follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what has the world become? Our society. Well, we've become a mess. What do we let ourselves see? I, I was looking at... Um, well, this is the difference. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, this is just the difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh. In the flesh, we're using our five senses. We're using hearing, uh, smelling, uh, taste, touch, sight. Mm -hmm. um, in the Walking in the spirit, we're, we're using the spirit. You know, we're, we're using the Holy Spirit. We're using the Holy Spirit to... Uh, to um, we're setting our mind on things above by using the Spirit and not, not on earthly things. Go ahead with what you were going to say. Well, I, probably, I that, interrupted no, you. No, no, that's okay. That's all right. But Because that brings us to another point that is a good point. Um, then how do we account for, uh, I agree with you uh, in, in totality of what you're saying, but that raises this question. Mm -hmm. How do we account then for the new babies in Christ, the new born-again people, or the born-again people who have been, they're not new babies anymore, but they've been uh, what they think is a mature Christian, but they're not because they lack knowledge of who they are in Christ. How do we deal with that portion of the born-again body of Christ? How can we qualify that? You know, because they too fit in that societal, societal uh, group of what they're watching is wrong, what they're allowing their eyes uh, in their eye gates and their ear gates and what they're reading and stuff into their hearts. You know what I mean? I have, uh, my experience has been, <clears throat> and that I'm, where I'm drawing from is this, the vast amount of born again believers are not where you and I are, Karen. They are in, in lack of knowledge and steep to the point where they they don't know the Holy Spirit. They have heard about Him, but they don't. They aren't born. They aren't. Uh, they aren't baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where they see the power. Most people, when they get born again, want that. But and I, I deal a lot with elderly, other elderly people, and the sure. elderly people are the ones that don't have the Holy Spirit. You know, and they they pray and they they devout. Oh, they're wonderful Christians, wonderful born again believers. They believe in Jesus Christ. They believe in all the stuff that's being said, but they don't pray in the spirit. And I ask them, do you pray in the spirit? No. Why? Because I don't know how. Okay, then you're obviously not born in, again. And I mean, you're born again, but you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. So I immediately then teach them and bring them into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But then they, because of their mindset and their age and their, you, people get older, they get set in ruts. You know what I mean? They just get blinders on and they go straight. It's not something, it's new, it's newfangled. I don't want to touch it. It's kind of scary. It's not scary. Mm -hmm. But if, as long as they're in church and we're all doing it, yay. You know, but to do it by myself, I just don't think so. Or I can't remember how, you know, I deal with this a lot. So here we have born again believers who have no power. They have no power. And since we're talking about the power, that's where I'm going. Uh, they have no power. They only can pray for you, but even then they're not sure that they're doing it correctly. You know what I mean? It's like, but all right, you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but do you, uh, when you pray for people, when you pray for their healing, do they get healed? Well, no, not always. Why? You see, they're, they're powerless. Well, it, um, it's not only the healer, but it's the faith of the believer also, because I had a caller called me the other night. He had had been to many healing rooms. He was depressed and uh, um, had anxiety, and um, he told me his whole background and so forth. And um, um, I, I lost my train of thought uh, now. You were talking about the power. Yeah, the power. So, so he had been to many healers before. So it it's not just it's not just um, you know it's not just the power of Jesus. Well, it is only the power of Jesus Christ, but it's also the faith of the believer, and it's also there's probably 
deep roots of wounds and strongholds and so forth that have to be dealt with. Uh, and I'm sure each of the people filled with the Holy Spirit, um, each of the healers was able to maybe get a facet of that, of that. I don't know, but there are, I mean, why aren't people being healed? <laughs> well, <laughs> my, that, my point that's exactly, whole, that's a whole nother, uh, is this broadcast. fellow, and my point is, is that the man that you're speaking about, was he born again? Yes. He okay. Told me he was that's exactly my point. That's exactly my point mm -hmm. because he'd been to many healers. And he wasn't healed. You see what I mean? Uh, and and because uh, maybe he doesn't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit. If he did, most people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit, they they know that the reason for the baptism in the Holy Spirit is to receive the power. Now, we don't understand the power once we get that. But we know that when one of the main reasons that we want the baptism in the Holy Spirit is because we are kind of hermetically sealed when we pray from the devil. And that what we say to God through the Holy Spirit, what he says through us, is always the right thing. So if we don't know what to pray, we can pray in, to in tongues, in our, in our spirit, in our, from our spirit man, in our prayer language. And he, and he always knows the right thing to pray. We can say, I want to pray for the troops, but I don't know in my English head, intellect, what to say past take care of them and don't let them get bombed and hurt you know, I mean, things like that i'm being very base but you know what i mean i don't know and so i can pray maybe two seconds on that or maybe i forget it altogether because it's not i want to but i don't know what to say you know what i mean so you pray in the spirit and you say I'm, i want to pray for the troops right now and then begin to pray in your prayer language pray in the spirit and the holy spirit is praying the exact proper per perfect prayer to protect them to, to lift them up to feed them to keep them out of harm's way whatever it takes that god wants for these people that he'll protect them and that hedge of protection goes around them that i might not have the word in my intellect or the words in my intellect and my vocabulary to get that across. I might spend an hour belaboring the point with God, beating him up with re repetitious prayers that he says, don't do that, because I'm only operating in my natural state rather than in the spiritual state. When you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you begin to operate in the spirit. And prior to that, you leave your spirit man completely out of it other than he, then he reaches out and, and is rejuvenated through Christ Jesus. So there you have it. And your head and your mind, I mean your head knowledge, your intellect and your heart don't connect. It's like a light, light uh, lamp with the cord laying on the floor and here's the light socket over here. All you have to do is plug it in and you're never ever going to be without light again. But you need the whole package. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm saying. These people, and I, my heart breaks for them and I, it's something I'm absolutely frantic about. It's like, let me, here, here, let me help you receive the Holy Spirit because you need it. It's the power. It's the authority. And once they get a taste of it, boom, they're gone. You know, it's like they run with it. And they may vacillate in and out occasionally, but the ones that are really up in age, they're, they kind of are afraid because they've never experienced it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they start, they'll pray with you at church and they'll pray in their spirit language because they hear you, then they go ahead and, and, and start to pray and what comes out is their own prayer language. And they're delighted. And then they go home and they can't remember how to do it, you know, because they're elderly and whatnot. Well, that's, that's another avenue that we could travel some other day. But I mean, the Lord, the Lord knows, but you're, in order for you to be powerful or receive the power and operate in the power, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm just going to put it there and leave it hang because you do. If you don't do it, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you won't be able to uh, uh, operate in what Karen and I are teaching you because you won't have the power. And that's where you have to go to get it. So that's a, a vitally important thing. Um, and, and your point that you were making was exactly my point, too. You know. Yeah, and uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, um, you just have to ask for it, right? I mean, the, the Word tells us that just we just have to ask for it. You just need it. Well, you just need it. You want it. You know, I mean, I'll, I, my, my testimony on this is this. I went to church after church after church, and every time they had an altar call for baptism of the Holy Spirit, I went forward. And I had hands laid on me so many times I could have counted the bruises, but they didn't hit me. <laughs> anyway, you know, I went forward every single time, and, and then they would get to the point where they say, okay, they pray over me and lay hands on me, and then they say, now give utterance. And I go, uh, 
what am I supposed to do? I mean, do I just go, oh, and my tongue's going to start wagging? I mean, am I going to pass out? My eyes roll back in my head. What am I, am I, tell me what to expect because what happened? Fear. Fear ran right in. Now, who is that from? God? No, but the devil goes to church. And he went right in there, landed on my shoulder and said, don't do it. You don't know you're going to be out of control, you know? Well, it's not only fear. It could also be doubt or unbelief. <coughs> like, can be. it could also be doubt or unbelief. Like, okay, what do I do? Well, it, you know, it may not be fear, but, you know, what do I do? I mean, Exactly. And, it's lack of instruction. You know? Yeah, and I always tell people just speak in, uh, just let it flow and speak in nonsensical syllables. Mm -hmm. And uh, that seem, you know, that seems to help. Well, couple, that seems to help people. That that's true, and it does. And and for me, I have a somewhat analytical mind. I'm not totally analytical, but I, the mm. I had spent so much time studying all the alternatives, <laughs> you know, that uh, it had to be explained, it and it better make good sense. Well, of course, we know that what we believe makes no sense because we mm. believe in something we can't see, and there's power, and we see the power, and you know what I mean, it's the manifestation. So, uh, But my head was very much in the world. I wasn't in the fluff of it, having fun and doing all the wild and woolies, even though I did some of those, not not drugs or anything, but um, I went out honky-tonking and stuff, you know, and drinking, and I did my fair share uh, before getting born again. But it had to make sense. You know, this has to make sense to me. So if I'm going to do this, and I'm going to accept Jesus as my Savior, what am I being saved from? You know, and when you say, well, from the world. Well, that doesn't make any sense, because I'm out here in the world, and I'm thriving, you know. I'm, yeah, and some know. people that are called back into the world to <clears throat> save people. That's right. That's right. I mean, it's just, it really is kind of a spiritual separation um, where we become a holy people, uh, where we, you know, the Bible says we become a peculiar yes, <laughs> kind, yeah, of, yeah. kind of ho uh, a, a holy people. And um, so... Um, well, but here's the thing. For me, it was like, for, I'm, I'm going to say at least three or four years, I went to every church service I went to, I had them hilly hands on me for baptism in the Holy Spirit. Finally, one day, uh, my sister, and it was fear. It was fear because I didn't want to be out of control. Mm -hmm. I didn't want something happening to me that I was unaware of. I wanted mm -hmm. to be awake through the whole process, you know. And uh, they weren't, weren't sharing and forthcoming with any information. And then to say, well, give utterance, and I didn't know how. Nobody would explain. I said, well, how do I do that? You just open your mouth, and it'll come out. Well, I opened my mouth. Nothing came out because I wasn't articulating, you know what I mean? <clears throat> it was all a bunch of mumbo jumbo as far as I was concerned. <coughs> but I wanted it. And the more I didn't have it, the more I wanted it. Sure. So I went, uh, my sister came to that, visit. That's the principle that kind of works, you know, the uh -huh. more you try to keep somebody from something, the more they want it. Exactly. And so my sister came to visit me and I was, I had a restaurant, a uh, 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 dinner house and whatnot. Anyway, we were on our way to a, a restaurant supply to pick up some stuff, and I said, "She's a born again believer." And I said, um, "Do you pray in? Uh, do you, are you baptized in the Holy Spirit and pray in other tongues?" And she said, "Yes." And I said, "Oh, do it! I want to hear it." <laughs> so she did, you know. And I said, "I want that in the worst way." And I've gone to church after church after church for years, and I and I don't have it. And I said, "So I guess I'm just not supposed to get it." Aha, uh -huh. here's another mis misnomer, another deception of the devil, right? I guess I'm just not supposed to have it. And she said, oh, oh no, it's for every believer. And so she, I said, well, she asked me about how, what was going on, and I told her, and she said, you just don't know how to do it. She said, so what I'm going to do is this. I will pray in my prayer language. You try to copy what I'm saying. But what will come out is your prayer language. And I said, okay. So she pulled over to the side of the road, and she did that. And I began praying or making noises because give utterance, you see. I began to make the noises that I thought she was doing. But what came out was something that sounded like an Indian rain dance, you know. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it was baby talk. It was baby talk. And, um, and Well, then, that, that makes me think the first person that um, baptized me in the Holy Spirit was this doctor I was telling you about. Uh -huh. And uh, I don't think I did it really well at that time. They said, oh, you're beginning, you're beginning. Mm -hmm. But it was um, one night at home, I was just practicing it and just felt the Holy Spirit. 
There you go. Come through. Come that's through, what my sister know? told me. Go home and practice it. When you're in the bathroom, when you're uh, in the kitchen, when you're in the car, whatever you're doing in the shower, pray all the time in the spirit. Practice it. You can, you'll find that you can turn it on and you can turn it off anytime you want to. So mm -hmm. I, I investigated it. I, I, I loved it. I got in it. I was pr practicing it in my bedroom when I was getting dressed, you know. And what I noticed was this. I noticed that my language began to develop into something stronger. Pretty soon it wasn't a monotone. It had inflection like a language mm -hmm. like when you talk to somebody and we speak with you know gusto or we or we speak softly or you know that kind of thing and um it actually became a second language you know <laughs> and so actually i i like to consider that my first language and my second language is the one i use to speak to everybody else with mm -hmm. um and and but i i was so delighted with it that i i did it all the time so that i could practice it and like I said, I was aware of it because I wanted it so badly that I learned and I listened. And as I listened to it coming forth, I heard different times that it sounded like a different language altogether. Mm -mm. You know, because that's God's prerogative, not mine. And, I, and it made me feel wonderful, not physically or anything like that, but just emotionally I felt wonderful because my heart was that I wanted everything God had for me and I wanted it now. And so for me, that was like... God speaking through me, and I thought, you're using me, yay! <laughs> Even if it was just to reach somebody else, like the Holy Spirit, reaching him with my prayer of whatever it was for whoever it was, you know? Yeah, well, and delighted. one thing about speaking in tongues, too, is that um, not only are uh, the Holy Spirit we're speaking to God perfectly with a perfect uh, language and mm -hmm. and whatever, you know, if we're using it for our prayers or whatever. But one thing it does is alleviate anxiety also. Oh, my. Yes. Yes, it does. Now, I know that this is a real rabbit trail, but it isn't because we need to uh, punctuate everything that we're talking about here with the underlying power that's there, and it's from the Holy Spirit. He is the expediter. God and Jesus Christ, God talks to Jesus, Jesus talks to him, they make the decision, and then they send it to, to the Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of Christ, and he is the expediter. He makes sure that it happens. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. he is the vehicle that carries our prayers to heaven and carries our results back to us, you know? Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important that we understand that, and that if you are a born-again believer and you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, let Karen and I know, Karen or I, either of us, or your pastor know, and get with somebody who is and have them help you uh, get get born in the, uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Because it's, uh, it's, your, it's your inherent power. It's the, it, look at it like this. If you are a car and you have a great big, um, uh, you have a normal engine, then you have that engine removed and you have a big fat engine that has a lot of horsepower put in its place. Now, you try to start it with the key and it just goes all right. But somebody goes under the, the hood and shoots the carburetor with ether or whatever that mm -hmm. stuff is in a can and then you go boom and it starts right up. And mm -hmm. now when you put your foot to the throttle, you have power. Okay, so it's just like that. That baptism in the Holy Spirit is that shot in the carburetor of the ether. <laughs> and you need it in order to get the power operating in your life. You know, it's as simple as that. And then the more you use it, the more power you have. And that is when we begin to see signs and wonders. And I don't know any born again believer to this day that I have ever encountered that did not want to see signs and wonders operating in their life. Signs and wonders will follow the believers. You, you have all been given a measure of ministry. You may not be called to the fivefold, but you will be get, you're all given as born again believer, a measure of ministry so that whatever job you're doing in this world, whether it's secretary, auto mechanic, uh, restaurant person, cook, uh, whatever it is, or executive, the people that you come in contact with will be blessed by you through your ministry. Your ministry could be in your lifestyle and how you exhibit it. It doesn't have to be verbal. 
but it should also be verbal. You can't be cursing all the time and, and taking the Lord's name in vain and whatnot and then trying to live this wonderful lifestyle because that's mocking. You have to be sincere. And But but what I'm saying is it's not always stand on a pulpit or on a street corner or hand out a tract or something like that. You can be doing this with your whole life, just the way you live, and the, the uh, exhibiting Jesus Christ in your life. Okay? So, uh, everybody's been given a measure. And if you're not out there with the power behind it that gives you the, the oomph, the gusto, the, the wherewithal to do it, to be and to live that life and to walk in Christ and to have that love walk uh, uh, manifest so that others can see it, then you're a Christian, a born-again believer with no power. And that's it. Simple as that. And you need the Holy Spirit for the power. Christ sits also far above all dominion. Curiatetos, lordship. In Colossians 1.16, we see uh, and find dominion connected with thrones, which throws light on the relative term might. First, uh, Colossians first, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Now in this passage from Colossians, the terms refer directly to spiritual powers, whereas in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10, it says, this is especially true of those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. And in Jude 8, we see this, uh, it says, in the very same way, these dreamers pollute their own bodies, reject authority, and slander celestial beings. So there were only two other occasions of the use of the word in the New Testament, and the primary reference is to earthly dignities. Um, so what I'm talking about here is God's power. So let's go back to the original one, and the curiatetos, which is lordship, is found in Colossians 1.16. It's by him, and, and you'll notice that in Jesus' name, they don't capitalize it until after the resurrection, okay? But uh, by him, we're talking about Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, because remember, he hung up his deity to come down here and be the propitiation for our sins so that we could be redeemed by his blood. He knew that he was born here to die for us. That's what he came to earth for. And to gather all of us as he could while he was here into himself. And mm -hmm. thank God he did. Because even after he has gone home in heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, his spirit comes and gathers us into him continually. Okay, so that's another reason why the Holy Spirit's important. Okay, so um, uh, then we have... In this age, he sits far above every name that is named, not only in this world, aeon, age. The great names of this age are below our Lord. The writer of Hebrews took pains to point out to Israel that even Moses was inferior to Messiah, Christ, as a servant is less than his master. But what an effort religious leaders today are making to show that Jesus was only a man. And since he was just a man, they rank him with the best man. On one of the great buildings, uh, church buildings of New York, a group of world-famous men appear over the door, among them Emerson and Einstein and uh, Confucius and Buddha and so many more. And with them is the figure of Jesus as one among many. Well, not so, says the Spirit of Truth in his setting forth of the majesty of Jesus, the divine Son of God. There are none that can be compared to him. He is far above all. And in this continual attempt to exalt humanity, we have to recognize the working of Satan, who deceived our first parents with falsehood. And the falsehood that they received was this, you shall be as gods, with a small g. Now why do I call that a falsehood? Because they already were as gods. They had God's creative abilities, his DNA, and looked like him. They were in fact chips off the old block, so to speak. They were his offspring and creation. They were deityized, yet not gods, not with a capital G, but brothers and sisters to Jesus the Christ with little g's. So uh, we have to understand that and, and get a hold of the fact that that's part of who we are and where we come from and how we are developed in God's eyes and what we're supposed to be. Now, it says about Jesus, at all, but also in that, which is to come, all right? So the age, the age to come. The coming age also can find no name that ranks with the name of our Lord. 
you know, we're breaking this scripture down here. In this age, the now dominant spirit forces will be bound. I want you to understand that all these dominant spiritual forces will be bound. Their successors, us, the glorified church, will recognize the preeminence of their glorious King Jesus and united with him as head and body, we mm -hmm. will have become manifested as his fullness. Yes, that's right. We are the fullness of God. He fills all in all, but has chosen to do so through his body. Therefore, in the age to come, now get this, we, the members of Christ, the body of Christ, those of us believers who know who we are in Christ, will have an active ministry for God throughout the limitless extent of his universe. So, what's under his feet? Well, he has put all things under his feet. The feet are members of the body. How wonderful to think that the least and lowest members of the body of the Lord, those who are, in a sense, the very soles of his feet, are above, far above, all the mighty forces of the enemy that have been, uh, we've been considering. So what's needed is for the church to awaken to an appreciation of her mighty place of privilege. The church doesn't know who she is. We as the body of Christ are exalted to rule over the spiritual powers of the air. And as Pastor Karen was saying earlier, that, that air that we're talking about is that that spirit of air. Spirit, spirit of air. It's that spirit of, of, the demon, of the demonic. So look at how often the body of Christ has failed their ministry of authority. I mean, think about it. At this time, we seem more often to grovel before those powers of darkness in fear. Why? Because we haven't been taught our place, our powers, who we are in Christ. Yeah, well, I think one of the reasons we aren't taught is when people look at the Great Commission, they say, okay, we go out and we preach the gospel. But Jesus also said more than that in Mark uh, 16. He said, "Those these signs will follow those who believe. Mm -hmm. So he's telling us, these are the power, some of the power gifts that I'm going to give you, um, that not only are you going to go out and preach the gospel, but you're, you're going you're to be empowered by speaking in tongues, by casting out demons, by, you know. And so people don't understand that, I mean, they don't understand that power. And, and you know, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So other, so we can walk as we can walk as Jesus did, because Jesus said, you know, um, greater things than these will you do. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because I go to the Father. Uh, you know, if he hadn't gone to the Father, we wouldn't be where we are today, sitting here teaching this and understanding it ourselves so that we could help others understand it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing when you think back over all of it. Jesus is head over all. Head over all things to the church is what the scripture says. Now we've been completely unable to grasp the force of this particular marvelous truth. We think of it as if it was indicated that Christ was simply in all things, in all circumstances and places, the church's head. But let's reverse the words in order to bring out more clearly their deep and powerful significance. Head to the church over all things. His being head over all things is for the church's sake. The church, his body, may be head over all things through him. You see, we are, con we are included in the Godhead. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. We are in Christ. We are seated in Christ in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. So, I've said this so many times, we are not God, Jesus, holding his le his right hand and then we hold Jesus's right hand and flying mm -hmm. out here in the breeze like a flag whipping mm -hmm. around we are in Christ so it's God the Father Jesus Christ the Son in the Father us in Jesus Christ in God the Father we are hidden in Christ in God that's a scripture <laughs> so we are one and uh, one and part of the Godhead so, his being head over all things is for our, the church, us, our sake. The church, his body, may be head over all things through him. We need to sit reverently for a long time before these uh, 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 mighty truths so that their tremendous meaning may be rooted and grounded in our hearts. It's not something to get puffed up over. It's something to get a hold of so that you can see who you are in Christ. And then, when you get a hold of your purpose and you see what your purpose is, you will see why it's so important and you will do it because and you'll do it at any cost because you know that it has to be done 
Now, in this attitude, the spirit of truth can lift us up into spiritual comprehension, which the human mind will always fail to achieve and quite simply can't do it, can't achieve it on its own. So, the, uh, here's the part that's going to shake you and rattle you in your cage. The argument, which, <laughs> <laughs> the argument which we have been following has been centered, for the most part, in the epistle to the Ephesians. Then, we went over to the epistle to the Colossians in order to get a different perspective on the authority of the believer. I know that I've slowed down my speech, but it's because I don't want to say it too fast. <laughs> because if I do, you'll lose the whole thing of it. This authority and its operation is based on the working of the Father. Write it down. This authority and its operation is based on the working of the Father. We also see that the success of the working of the Father depends on the subjection of Christ to God. Now think about this. Jesus was down here and he listened to the Father because he was in prayer uh, five or six hours or well, I'll say four to five hours a day in the Father's face while everybody else was sleeping. He went away where they, nobody could get to him where he could be and commune with the Father one on one. And then he went about setting about doing whatever the Father purposed it for him to do that day. He did mm -hmm. this every day. It wasn't something that he did once a week or once in a month or that he did it every single day. And if you think about it in the Old Testament now, we're still in the Old Testament while Jesus is alive. And um, so uh, the, the apostles were with him and they slept and they ate and they followed him and they studied him. They were studying him and the things that he was teaching them which is what we're teaching you. <laughs> and in their doing that, they were well taken care of. They didn't have to pray or they didn't have to. I mean, if he called for them to pray, they would. But he had to teach them to pray, you know. And they were at all those meetings when all the multitudes were there saying, teach us how to pray, you know. And he, they gave him, he gave them an outline. And that's what the uh, uh, Lord's Prayer is, is an outline. So anyway, they were taken care of. They, he fed them. He, he manifested the loaves and fishes so that they ate. He, they didn't have to do anything except study and listen. He did that on purpose so that they would listen and learn because they didn't have to think about something else. Their focus was totally on him and what he was teaching them. Now, okay. Okay. they were under his grace. It was his grace that did that, took care of them. And um, even though... He was co-equal with the Father. The Eternal Son accepted a subordinate place. And when he came to this earth, he accepted a subordinate place and undertook the task of reconciling through the blood of his cross all things unto God. Colossians 1 verse 20 says this, And through him, small h, to reconcile to himself, small h, all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, small h, shed on the cross. And I'm emphasizing the small h because I want you to realize that he was still a man. Mm -hmm. Having for this purpose yielded himself, capital H, <laughs> under the power of death, he was quickened by the operation of God the Father. That's Colossians. All right, that's a scripture. Colossians 12, uh, chapter 2, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him, small h again, through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. All right, pay close attention. Now let's look closely as, as we read Colossians 2, 12 through 15, making special <clears throat> note that the working indicated here, you ready to get rattled, is all on the part of God the Father. Colossians 2, 12 through 15. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing, them, triumphing over them by the cross. It is he, capital H, who in verse 13 quickened the saints together with Christ, and forgave their trespasses. It is he who, in verse 14, blotted out the adverse decrees of the law, which stood in the way of his people, 
and nailed the canceled handwriting to the cross of his son. It is he who, in verse 15, spoiled Lapicadea Someno, completely stripped the mighty principalities and powers that had opposed the resurrection of the Lord, and led them captive in triumphal procession in Christ, out of Hades and into heaven. A common and frequent misunderstanding of this passage is this, that the Lord Jesus stripped off from himself the clustering powers of darkness, overthrowing them and putting them to open shame. The correct rendering shows clearly that the agent is God the Father. So let's look deeper. Just what does he strip the powers of the air of? Ready? Of the authority mm -hmm. that's been ours and was stolen from the Garden of Eden. Death is the penalty of sin, my friends, and when Christ, bearing the burden of the world's guilt, went down to death, they sought to exercise their ancient prerogative and hold him under death's power. But in the wisdom of the Father, the yielding of the righteous one Jesus to death discharged that long-established bond of the law. In great exultation, the Father nailed the canceled bond to the cross of his Son and then went about stripping off the ill-gotten authority of the principalities and powers. God then handed this authority to his son. The show, Triumphal Procession, which the apostle figuratively uses in relating this glorious event, corresponds to the elevation of the son above his enemies, which is mentioned in Ephesians. So, in Colossians, the subject, stressed, is the father's working in the act of thwarting and overthrowing of the hostile powers and their subjugation to his son, while in Ephesians, the Son is seen seated above these in all the authority of the Father's throne. So the authority of the believer isn't taught as fully in Colossians, although the statement is made that in him, his people are complete, literally made full. That is to say that through union with him, they partake, we partake of the fullness of the Godhead, which is practically another form of being blessed with all spiritual blessings. You see where you reside? Do you see the power you have? Now we saw in a previous lesson that the Lord has, as head of overall, which I've taught this on other programs, but as the Lord as head overall, his position mm -hmm. and power are supreme. Why mm -hmm. then is there not more manifest progress? Here it comes, because a head is wholly dependent upon its body for the carrying out of its plan, amen? So, all the members of its body must be subservient that through their coordinated ministry, what is purposed may be accomplished. Now, the Lord Jesus, head over all things to the church, which is his body, is hindered in his mighty plans and working because his body has failed to appreciate the deep meaning of his elevation and to respond to the gracious impulses which he is constantly sending to his body for its growth and life. This is the most vital truth of the divine working that the Word of God is patterned by, which the ministry of the church is framed. The glory of the body of Christ is the fact that its members are living members, each with a personal will. The Holy Spirit comes into these individual members in order to bring them into unity with the will of the Father and the purposes of the head. But this is not done through inward impulse alone. Inward impulse inaugurates obedience towards the head, but the renewed mind can't be fully instructed except through the Word of God. Consequently, it's only as the Word is diligently meditated upon, understood, and obeyed that the head has freedom of action through its members. Now, the importance of this can be seen by comparing Ephesians 5.18 with Colossians 3.16. But I can do that in a second. Did you want to say something? No, I was just going to say... Um that uh, every time now uh, that Satan tries to accuse us mm -hmm. um, of something, God can justly say that the penalty of whatever part of the law that we may have broken does not apply to us anymore because we are not under the rule of the law, but under grace. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Perfectly right. And um, to get into the importance of, it, of the comparison so that you can see it, in the first passage... The stirring of the inward emotions of the heart with the consequent subjection of believers one to another in their various relations is indicated as the working of the Spirit of God in His fullness. But in the second passage, I'm talking about uh, Colossians. Uh, first one is Ephesians 5.18. Second passage is Colossians 3.16. Um, so in the second passage, exactly the same results are pointed out to be the result of the rich indwelling of the Word of Christ. Now the Word of Christ 
is the setting forth of his will in a form that's understandable by the renewed mind. But the renewed mind, while understanding the word, lacks power to perform it. So the fullness of the Spirit is the incoming of the Holy Spirit of God to empower the human spirit to put into effect the accepted will of the head. You can see how it operates. Do you understand what's being said here? Unless the word richly indwells the body, us, born-again believers, for the instruction of the mind, the Spirit of God, although present in His fullness, in your body, in your being, because you're born again, has nothing to work with. The okay, so you can be speaking in tongues, and if you haven't got the Word um, indwelling in you, you're saying that the Holy Spirit has nothing to work with? No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that, uh, what I've said is that the unless the Word richly indwells the body. In other words, we need the Word of God. We can't just be a, a couch Christian. We can't be born again, sit on the couch, and don't do anything with our, our belief because we'll never grow. We are designed to grow in the Word. So when we go to church, we hear the Word. Even if we're slow growers, we're still growing. You know, we're getting the Word. So what I'm saying, though, is that Word of God is for our instruction of our mind to get mm -hmm. the intellect tuned into the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the Spirit of God is present in its fullness in our bodies because we're born again. We are now bone of Jesus' bone, flesh of his flesh. We are mushed and, and formed together with him, and we can never be separated from him. We can never lose our salvation. We could never go back to being unborn again. You can't go backwards through the womb, you know, and the womb is a spiritual womb through Christ. We were the, went through the door. We can't go back. The door is locked. There's no doorknob on our side. We can't get out. So nothing can ever separate us from God. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God, and nothing could separate us from Jesus Christ. We are in Christ for all eternity. So we can be in Christ, and we are the fullness of God in Christ. But unless we're growing from instruction of the Word to teach us who, who we are, what our purpose is, how, what power we have, God has nothing to work with. Because we, he, we're we not giving him anything, you see. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. You can pray in the Spirit. and when. You, but what I'm saying, and actually what I'm saying to you, is that 99% of the people that are in that category, the couch Christians that I'm talking about, born-again believers who don't do anything, are not, uh, they're not um, baptized in the Holy Spirit. They don't have that. So they're just mm -hmm. sitting there doing nothing. And when they pray, their prayers hit the ceiling and fall back, you know, because they're not learning. They're not reading the Bible. They're not, they're not interested. They just got their ticket, and that's all they wanted. And yes, I don't want you to worry if you're one of those, because uh, you do get to go to heaven, and you will be, not be cast out. But you will pay uh, uh, homage. I, I shouldn't say homage. You, you will be uh, held accountable before the Lord, for what you've done with the Word of God once you were born again. Mm -hmm. So you'll stand accountable. Mm -hmm. You know, now, the and it's never too late to get started, okay? <laughs> the impulse is. Well, of, James says, what? Faith without works is dead, dead. right? That's right. Mm -hmm. And so then, then you, that's why they're floating backwards and they're, they're actually tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They are buffeted by the enemy. They come into agreement, and they're, they're dying early at young ages. They're going away because of their lack of understanding. They don't know who they are, and they don't know what's expected of them because they never bothered to grow. They just got the ticket. That was the important thing. Tonight, well, I think that's the, that's the importance of having, being discipled. Well, yeah, but 99, well, I'm going to say 99%. I'm going to say a goodly portion has never been discipled or they've been improperly discipled. I wasn't discipled. That's why I struggled for so many years. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, God I discipled mean, me himself, <laughs> you know, or Jesus did, I mean. Well, that, yeah, or the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. also disciples us. But, um, yeah, I think that shows where discipleship is so important. Well, it, Karen, remember when we were because talking... Because I don't think born-again Christians want to be couch Christians. No, they don't. They don't. I, they just they end up there. <laughs> they just need proper guidance from mm -hmm. the leadership, you know? Exactly. And when they're not discipled, it's... Uh, I'm not... Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing them and, and putting them down and saying yeah. it's their fault. I'm saying there there are reasons why they are the way they are. 
All right. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not saying that at one point in time they weren't hungering and thirsting for the things of God, but God had a plan for me, and He has a plan for every single one of us. And because I want everything He has now, I didn't want to wait until I got to heaven for it. And I mm -hmm. said to Him, I don't want to wait. I want everything You have for me now. Well, little did I know that I was saying exactly what He was saying. Guess what? You're going to get it. <laughs> you know? But... Remember, remember, we were talking in our lesson last week and then the week uh -huh. before that. And you and I were going to undertake to discuss that indescribable uh, uh, um, gravitational pull. That is, uh, it's a, it's an, uh, it's not indescribable. Oh, I can't think of the name of what I called it, but it's, it's like an, it's a. It's a, a gravitational pull that puts, uh, that's put on us even before we're born again to be born again. To mm -hmm. draw, it draws us towards Christ. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that we're looking, we're on a, on a search and we're looking for, and it's not indescribable, it's whatever it was. It was, uh, uh, but it starts with an I. But anyway, uh, that's part of this. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. if we, if we weren't given that impulse, if we weren't given that, that, um, indiscriminate or whatever it is uh, drawing to Christ and we can't even recognize that that's what it is we wouldn't be born again we'd be left to our own devices you see but that pull is there God has put that gravitational pull in place so that we will be drawn to Christ to the door so that we can go through it and um, he wants us to be the fullness. He's trying to get everybody into heaven. You know, that's what his, he wants all of his creation in there. He loves all of us. Now, the impulses of the head, though, um, can't be translated by him into an appropriate action through the body. All right. And we're talking back here about uh, Christ again. The spirit of God, although present in his fullness, has nothing to work with. And the impulses of the head, the, Jesus, can't be translated by him into appropriate action through the body. In other words, what he's instructing us to do, the purposes that we have, we can't do that, but are often like the immature emotions of a child because we, when we're talking about people who are not uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit and so on, their, their emotions, the he, they're just flopping around like a fish out of water. They, they vacillate to and fro, they, you know, and they, they spew improper doctrine because they have not been discipled properly or because of their lack of desire to be. A lot of people don't want to go to church. They Then they start with this, oh, I don't believe in organized religion. You know, well, uh, so much for that. Organized or disorganized. Religion is nothing anybody's interested in. But a relationship with Christ, you better be interested in it. So the head, though, if that's the case, is hindered because the body hasn't grown up into the stature of a perfect man, which is God's design for mankind. If we had grown up the way we were supposed to be, discipled into Christ, grown up to become the, the perfect man that, that God has decide, designed for us to be, we would be all things that we should be. Remember when I told you we started poet and I explained it to you and I said, if all of us born again believers locked arms like a chain link fence, we would circle the globe and the, the devil would be driven out because of who we are, but we have to know who we are, you see. And right. um, in divine patience, the head is waiting. He still waits. He waits for us. We are to blame greatly not only for our own weakness, but also for the hands that hang down and palsied knees. God helps us to realize this, and, and I hope that he does through our teaching and and, you know, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This isn't a condemnatory teaching. This is a supplication to you as the body of Christ to open your eyes and your heart and hunger once again for the, the oh, I always feel like a cornflake when I'm not with God because I feel all crunched up. And But when I'm in the Lord's presence, it's like he poured milk on that cornflake and it's now all soggy and full and puffy, <laughs> you know, soft and squishy. I want you to be soft and squishy. And I want God to help us realize this and to fulfill our ministry through the the word both to others and to the Lord. Do you have anything mm -hmm. further on this? No, no, I think uh, that was very, very good lesson. Okay, well, I hope that it came across. If not, please contact us. I want you to get this. It's so important. 
But right now, if you desire to come into and dwell in the miraculous presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, if you desire to be in Christ and avail yourself of his marvelous wisdom, you must give your life to him. It's very simple and pain-free. And in just a moment, Pastor Karen is going to give you that opportunity. Yes, uh, family of God, we want to give you a chance every broadcast to repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, he will instantly pardon your infinite debt today as you come to him. So please uh, say this after me. Jesus, 
I believe that you are the Son of the living God. You were born, you came in the flesh to atone for my sins and all sickness and disease on the cross, and you were raised from the dead after three days. I come to you today, Lord Jesus, to repent of my sins, sins that I may know of and sins that I may not know of. And I ask you to forgive me, and I ask you to come into my heart today. I make you my Lord and Savior now and forever. I thank you for your grace, your love, your mercy, and your compassion for me. I believe that once I was lost, but now I am found, and I choose to serve you, Lord, all the days of my life. Family, if you prayed that prayer, we welcome you into the family of God. We, uh, If you need discipleship, which is, I think is one of the most important things, and I've had very good discipleship from Pastor Stephanie, uh, please contact us and we'll give you our contact information at the end of this broadcast. Behold the Lamb I will worship Seated high upon the throne Behold the Lamb I will honor Magnify the Holy One My joy and laughter The love that I'm the only thing that matters to me There in sorrow He sees my tomorrow His ear is always listening Behold high upon the That's why I'm standing, my story's ending, the passion that compels me to go on. Strong tower, he is righteous. 
elements of the covenant that I asked you to assemble at the beginning of the program. Lift them up before the Lord as I pray. Father, we praise you and worship you with these elements of the covenant. We thank you that your only begotten Son, Jesus, gave his life sacrificially so that we may live and have life more abundantly. We thank you now as this bread becomes our portion of his healing body and the vibrancy of his life within us. We thank you that as we partake of the body of Christ, we become healed and made whole and completely restored. We thank you that this beverage becomes our portion of his cleansing blood, that we are continually washed in the waterfall of his blood and renewed within as we continually remember his act of love on the cross on our behalf. In the name above all names, the matchless name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Karen, we want to give us a little history? Sure. There is a historical comparison of um, communion in the Old Testament with the communion that we are partaking in the New Covenant. Um, the Hebrews, if you remember, what, before they came out of Egypt, they sacrificed a lamb and put the blood on the doorpost of the house. In Exodus 12, 13, God said, When I see this blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you. So thus the Hebrew families were protected from both sickness and death as a result of the blood and body of the Lamb. Hallelujah. So we see that the appointed festival of Passover became the forerunner of the Lord's Supper, where the Lord Jesus himself becomes the sacrificial lamb, and his blood was shed on the cross for not only our sins, but for our complete sozo healing. In fact, we understand that Jesus was having Passover with his disciples when he instituted the Last Supper with the New Covenant. And the New Covenant says that no longer would they emphasize deliverance from Egypt, but instead each time they took the cup of wine and the unleavened bread, they would celebrate deliverance from sin and the promise of eternal life. You see, the blood of the Lamb in Egypt was a foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus, who was identified as the Lamb of God by John the Baptist in John 1, verse 29, where he said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. So the historical application of Passover is that we see its prophetic fulfillment in Christ, who as God's final perfect Lamb died during Passover. Communion also denotes a sharing which reminds us not only of our redemption through Christ, but also our future inheritance with Christ in the kingdom of God. Matthew 26, verse 29 says, But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of this vine until the day that I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Now looking at the elements, the unleavened bread and the juice, the Jewish unleavened bread used during Passover was called the bread of affliction because of the Hebrew slavery in Egypt. However, with the new covenant in Jesus, it is called the bread of life. Uh, John 6, verse 32 through 33 says, Jesus said, I tell you for certain that Moses wasn't the one who gave you the bread from heaven, and the bread that God gives is the one who came down from heaven to give life to the world. I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger. He that believes in me shall never thirst. I am the living bread which came down from heaven, and if any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And continuing on, uh, we look at John 6, continuing on in verse 53 through 59. John tells us, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. 
Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So you see, we're not only proclaiming the Lord's death through this unleavened bread and juice that we partake today of in communion service, but we receive through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit a fresh impartation of life through uh, communion service today. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the representation of the bread and blood and communion service with you today. We know that you have created life eternally, and every time we partake of your body and blood, we receive a new infilling of your life through the Spirit. Amen. Now, the Word of God commands us to eat the bread and drink the cup. Continually take the bread, give thanks, break it, and eat it, and then take the cup, give thanks, and drink it, all in the remembrance of Jesus. The Lord commanded that the supper be repeated often, and yet we aren't given specific instruction as to how frequently the Lord's Supper is to be celebrated, but it is implied that it's to be done with frequency so that partaking of the Lord's Supper continually recalls to our mind our redemption by Christ from all sickness, all disease, and all sin. So do it as often as you want to and need to. As we are instructed, we discern the body and the blood of Christ as we prepare to partake. On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ broken for you so that every atom and molecule, every cell and tissue that makes up the skeletal framework and the muscular, blood vascular, neurological and epithelial systems and every organ in your body is and remains healed, made whole and completely restored. In the name of Jesus, our healer, the Christ. Amen. Partake of the body of our Lord and Savior. <laughs> In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of our Lord Jesus shed for you in celebration of the work that he did for you on the cross in the remission of all of your sins, past, present, and future. In the name of Jesus, our Redeemer, the Christ, amen. Partake of the blood of our Lord and Savior. My friends, <clears throat> the Lord's Supper is a feast. That's right, it's a feast of living union of believers with the Savior, whereby we spiritually and by faith receive Christ with all of his benefits and are nourished with the vibrancy of his life into eternal life. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Pastor Karen, will you close us with a blessing? Yes. Uh, family, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We hope that you received this today, and we pray that you did. And if you need further assistance with understanding any of our messages, please contact us. Pastor Karen's going to give you her contact information right now. <laughs> Okay, those of you who need prayer uh, privately, the best place to get me is Honoring Hands, H-O-N-O-R-I-N-G-H-A-N-D-S at AOL.com. Um, also, I have a prayer ministry and a, uh, healing, a healing and sort of soaking worship meditation uh, program that I just started on Spreaker called, called Refuge of Hope Healing and Prayer Room. I also have on Spreaker just Refuge of Hope Healing Room. And on Facebook, you can reach me under Refuge of Hope Healing Room or Pastor Karen Weitzman. Our, the website I share with Pastor Stephanie is themasterstouch.org. And I have um, some prayers there that you may want to look at if you're suffering depression or suicide uh, or s suicidal tendencies. Um, to look at those prayers and also all of our broadcasts that we do uh, here on Living the Word every Monday at 1 o'clock can be found on the website also and in the archives. Mm -hmm. Amen. Once again, uh, my contact information, but both of ours, the website, www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. You can email me on the webmail there, Dr. Stephanie at themasterstouch.org. That's D-R-S-T-E-F, like Frank, E-N-I, at themasterstouch.org. You can also email me at masterstouchhs at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at cox.net. Poet at cox.net, P-O-E-T at cox.net, which doesn't mean that I'm a poet. What it means is it's the, the letters that represent a poet represent Peace on Earth team. 
or M-T-H-S and the word prayer at Cox.net. That's the letter M, the letter T, the letter H, the letter S, and the word prayer at Cox.net. Thank you for joining us. Living the Word is brought to you every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, which is 1 p.m. Eastern and 12 noon Central. Remember, Proverbs 4, verse 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all of your getting, get understanding. And my friends, that's exactly what we're doing here, seeking and gaining God's wisdom from His Word. Living the Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We are a 501c3 organization. And we leave you today with this reminder. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 tells us that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Actually, it says, as He is. And the He that there's referring to is Jesus. So we just insert His name there so that we get the full picture. Right now, however Jesus is, perfect, prosperous, abundant, full of divine health and wholeness, walking in divine health, that's exactly how you are too. So meditate on that scripture until you become it, my friends. God bless you, and we look forward to you staying with us on the archives and listening to us every week on Monday at 10, 10 o'clock, I almost said 10.30, 10 o'clock a.m. <laughs> here, here on Spreaker.com. God bless you, and thanks for, for joining us. He forgives our failures and our sins So let Him be your Savior Let Him be your friend One who will accompany and cleanse Our God specializes in good things Things that you and I really need Good things for the body and spirit All you have